senior Chinese diplomat Yang Jiechi and U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo met in Hawaii on Tuesday. On the same day, U.S. President Donald Trump signed a bill on Xinjiang into law, a move that angered Beijing. What to make of these conflicting dynamics in U.S.-China relations? Can the meeting between the two countries' top diplomats stop the downward spiral between Beijing and Washington? We have a cutting-edge panel to talk about this today. Mr. Yan Xuetong is Distinguished Professor at the Tsinghua University and Secretary General of the World Peace Forum. Samir Han is a foreign policy analyst based in New Jersey, and Rick Dunham is a former White House correspondent for Business Week. Welcome to Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan. Professor Yan, uh, so good to see you there. Uh, you recently chaired the World Peace Forum, where leading experts debated about uh, U.S.-China relations and where they're headed. Um, I just want to get your sense on that question. To what extent do you think the meeting between Yang Jiechi and Mike Pompeo will de-escalate tensions between the two countries? Oh, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to your program, Mr. Wang. Uh, well, I think the discussion at the World Peace Forum uh, actually and uh, inconsistent with the result of the negotiation between the Yang Jiechi and the uh, uh, Mike P uh, Pompeo. And uh, the negotiation, the talk, actually resulted in no uh, common agreements. And uh, either side just uh, repeated what they, uh, their stance is. And rather than talking about the, what the other side's stance is uh, publicly. So, uh, from my understanding, uh, during the, uh, uh, the World Peace Forum and uh, all of the experts concerned, China and the U.S. relationship were getting worse rather, getting, uh, rather than uh, to be uh, improved. So, the, indicate, uh, the result of the Yang Jiechi and the Pompeo's uh, dialogue and uh, actually proved uh, what they guessed. And uh, uh, two, uh, two days ago. Now, here I want to say, even the dialogue between Yang Jiechi and uh, Pompeo did not uh, reach any agreement and uh, even no common understanding. I think it is still uh, po play, uh, playing a positive role. That means uh, at least it can temporarily and uh, prevent the relationship from uh, getting uh, even worse. So, this talk possibly can maintain the conflicts between China and the U.S. at the current level. So if we do not expect it too much from this dialogue, and we will uh, believe, and uh, maybe we think it's better to have a more talk like this uh, in the future. Well, Rick, in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, what do you think? Uh, if you compare the two statements from the two countries, um, on the Chinese side, the Chinese foreign ministry said, uh, you know, Beijing explicitly expressed uh, China's positions during the Yang Pompeo meeting. Uh, China emphasized the importance of U.S.-China bilateral relations, uh, talked about the issue of China's stance on Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Xinjiang. But if you look at the U.S. statement, it says uh, the secretary stressed the important American interests and the need for fully reciprocal dealings between the two countries across commercial, security, and diplomatic interactions. Uh, the two different statements, um, yes. they don't precisely match, do they? Right. It, no, it's parallel realities. I'm not very optimistic about the situation. Diplomats were diplomats. One thing is that they were on message. They repeated the messages of their governments. They did not do anything to exacerbate tensions, but they didn't really do anything uh, to solve the problems. Uh, China just said that it is going to go through with the trade agreement that it already had agreed to, and the United States uh, repeated its policies, and then Donald Trump went off on a tweet storm and a rant against China as Congress passed more anti-China legislation. So I think there's cognitive dissonance in Washington, and uh, Beijing is not really uh, offering anything new. So I don't see any reason for optimism at this point. And then, Rick, uh, then how do you look at uh, John Bolton's new book uh, that is stirring uh, quite a lot of uh, debate and controversy uh, where you are in Washington, D.C., right? Uh, shocking revelations about uh, President Trump's yeah. extraordinary moves to get reelected. Uh, uh, lots of chapters on Beijing, you know, currying in favor with Beijing to get reelected, right. according to the book. Well, uh, what do you think? 
It's fascinating on two levels um, with regards to China, in my opinion. Uh, the first one is that Donald Trump explicitly asked President Xi Jinping to interfere in the American election, something that uh, China and the uh, foreign ministry has publicly disavowed and, and, and uh, rejected in the, uh, in the wake of this coming out in the book. But it shows that what Donald Trump did with Russia, asking Russia and Ukraine to interfere in the election, he also did with China, something that no intelligent country in the world would do. You don't get involved in a presidential election, especially one where Donald Trump might lose. You don't want to anger the incoming president. The second issue uh, was Xinjiang, and where, Donald, uh, where John Bolton says that Donald Trump gave the approval for China to build camps and to uh, hold Uyghurs. And this is something that is very explosive in the United States, particularly at a time where Congress is passing sanctions and Donald Trump is signing them. So Donald Trump is denying uh, that these things happened. Uh, China is rejecting uh, what, uh, what was written in the book. So all it's doing is stirring the political pot in Washington. It's complicating Donald Trump and Republicans' efforts to run this campaign as an anti-China campaign because it looks like Donald Trump is weak on China, which is something that he, in his rallies, is trying to project the opposite. So it's fascinating to me. I don't know where it's going to go. Well, Professor Yan, in, in Beijing, uh, you know, this morning I just checked the latest polls. Uh, according to Real Clear Politics, uh, that combines uh, all polls, uh, President Trump is behind Joe Biden in not just national polls, but this time around in the polls of the key swing states in the Midwest that helped him uh, elected in the first place. Uh, how do you think that will weigh in Trump's China policy in the months to come? Well, I think uh, uh, if you compare China's uh, policy toward the U.S. and the U.S. policy toward China, I think uh, both these countries' uh, foreign policy are driven by two factors, external environment and uh, domestic policies. But in comparing the, of these two countries, you will find that uh, Trump's policy driven more by the domestic factors rather than external factors. And China may be the, policy, uh, the foreign policy mainly driven by the external uh, factors and uh, uh, more by uh, uh, external factors than domestic factors. So what I want to say, and uh, I think this is uh, uh, obvious, is to not, uh, not debate and uh, whether Trump's policy is mainly driven by domestic factors or by the election campaign. That's uh, very necessary because it is only uh, what, the, uh, five months left. You cannot believe that his foreign policy is not influenced by the election campaign. But then if you ask me, and uh, whether he has chance to win the second term or Trump uh, or the, uh, Biden will win the election, I don't know. I, I'm not an expert about Americans' uh, uh, domestic politics, and uh, I cannot make uh, any prediction about the, uh, campaign, the election campaign. Well, Professor Yan, you talk about um, you know, factors that would uh, influence a country's foreign policy. Um, i.e. external shocks, external conditions, domestic politics. Uh, what about the personal leadership um, styles? Um, you know, President Trump is um, surrounded by, you know, China hawks these days, but also there are um, people who are considered to be moderates in the White House. Uh, how do you think um, uh, President Trump's personal styles will uh, factor into the U.S.-China relations in the years, months and years to come? Well, uh, I like this question very much. And uh, mainly because uh, I just uh, published a book, Leadership and the, the Rise of the Great Powers, uh, last year. And uh, my theory and uh, regarding the national leadership is the fundamental independent variable for a uh, country's uh, uh, foreign policy. Because uh, the national interest, the mass politics, and the uh, foreign environment uh, only uh, lay the ground and the condition for policymakers to make decisions. So the different uh, type of uh, political leaders, they will have a different, uh, uh, strategic, uh, different uh, strategic preferences. So Trump uh, has a very special and uh, 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 strategic preferences. That's why make his policy so different from what uh, we, we are familiar with uh, the previous uh, uh, president uh, after the uh, Cold War in the United States. And uh, from my standing, 
this uh, policy making is uh, very, very personal. And uh, based on his uh, personal judgment and uh, personal uh, understanding about the world and, uh, and uh, personal interest, and uh, even his uh, personal uh, preference or sometimes his uh, personal emotion. So I think that his uh, policy is quite a personal. Certainly, this is a very different presidency that, that than we've seen uh, in the past uh, years and decades. Uh, Rick in Washington, D.C., let's talk about the issue of Xinjiang because uh, Washington just, uh, actually, President Trump just signed a bill on Xinjiang into law. Uh, under this uh, law, uh, Washington can impose sanctions on Chinese officials. Uh, they can also, uh, you know, um, uh, bring, you know, sanctions against them. Um, how do you view this bill and the fact that President Trump chose to sign this bill now? Um, yes, well, he's, uh, he signed it because, because it got to his desk. Uh, but really right now, what you're seeing is in Congress, there's a bipartisan uh, consensus uh, that China is bad. And it, it's probably in, in the years that I've covered American politics, uh, it is the most uh, aggressive anti-China consensus that I've seen. With Donald Trump, I don't think you can say there's a strategy going on. He sort of uh, is impulsive and he acts uh, with the latest, uh, his latest impulses. And if somebody attacks him, he will hit back. Um, I think right now what you see, though, is the foreign policy establishment, the State Department under Mike Pompeo, uh, is pretty harsh uh, on China, on human rights issues in general, uh, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and they're trying to push back also mm -hmm. about Taiwan. You've seen legislation there, and you've seen military action on the part of the United States. So I think right now the hawks are in the ascendancy, uh, yeah. and w who we would, the people we would call the trade doves are on the defensive. Right. Uh, Professor Yan Xuetong, what do you uh, think of this U.S. bill on Xinjiang? Well, uh, I, uh, I think uh, uh, this is not a coincidence. And uh, I don't think the U.S. Congress uh, has just prepared this and uh, uh, in, uh, in concern about the, the book by uh, uh, Bolton and to come out in this period. And this is already a long time uh, plan. So it's very possible the publishing of the book is a coincidence. But actually, for Trump, I don't think he has a plan to sign this treaty in this uh, uh, occasion and to impose pressure on Yang Jiechi for the negotiation, for the talk with Pompeo. I don't think this is a plan. And this is just a word for him. It's a not big deal. And uh, so his, his policy, uh, I agree, and uh, quite uh, uh, imposed but I uh, may, may not be guided by a, a strategy, but I will say, and the key policy is guided by a principle. The principle is clear, and the key concerns uh, is a very pragmatic principle. That means uh, how much the policy can consolidate its power uh, in the U.S. Well, last question to you before you go, Professor Yan. Um, with five months to go until November election and with the revelations by John Bolton's new book, do you think it's safe to say that in the next five months um, for Democrats and Republicans, President Trump and his opponents, it will only be about who can get tougher on China? Well, I, I don't think the book has that kind of influence. The book is a work plan. The book may cause a lot of uh, uh, undermine of uh, Trump's position in the U.S. But uh, from my understanding, even Trump and for make up this uh, to dealing with this kind of pressure and this new situation, take some policy toward uh, China. I don't think that's not a big deal. Anyhow, uh, these policies and uh, from Chinese side, I think uh, 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 policymakers has already prepared anything uh, may happen. But uh, generally speaking, I would say, and uh, I think it's a uh, uh, slightly to have a new Cold War, because no matter what kind of uh, ideological provocation the uh, Trump administration to uh, poke up, and uh, I don't think this kind of uh, ideological conflict would become the core of China-U.S. competition. And because in the age of the in the digital age, actually 
the major competition between China and U.S. is a technology superiority instead of an ideology superiority. All right, Professor Yan Xuetong, thank you so much for your insight. Uh, Yan Xuetong, distinguished professor from Tsinghua University, and Rick Dunham in Washington, hanging there. We'll get back to you soon. We'll take a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Rick Dunham, a former White House correspondent from Business Week. I want to get to you. Um, you know, at this point, it seems that um, U.S.-China relations takes one step forward and two steps backward. Do you think anyone or um, anyhow people can stop the Washington-China hawks uh, from making this relationship worse? I do, uh, but I, I think that in the short run, things will get worse because you have the election coming up. And uh, Donald Trump has called his opponent, Joe Biden, Beijing Biden. And Joe Biden wants to let the American people know uh, that he is not, quote, soft on China. And in the Senate, you have the Republican campaign committee saying, make this election about China, about coronavirus, about Xinjiang, uh, about Hong Kong. And Democrats uh, don't want to be considered soft on China. So I think the next few months, things will deteriorate and, uh, and diplomats will try to be diplomatic, but I don't think there will be a fundamental shift. After the election, I think there's a possibility of change either way. With Democrats, uh, I think there's a possibility that Joe Biden will want to repair relations with China just like he will want to repair relations with the U.S. allies, traditional allies in Europe and Asia uh, that Donald Trump has damaged. Uh, and if Donald Trump is elected, you just never know. There, I don't think there's a massive strategy. His entire strategy is focused on winning re-election right now. But I think uh, that there would be a possibility if Donald Trump wins that China could make progress in the relationship by buying more American products. I think that Donald Trump is transactional, if anything. Uh, and so I think there's possibility of hope after the election, but I think in the next five months, uh, things are going to sound pretty bad. And what would the China policy of a Biden White House look like? Well, I, I, I would say that he would get involved in traditional engagement uh, where there are differences that are laid on the table, but there's a diplomatic framework. I don't think that he would continue uh, with, with the Trump tariff uh, regimen. I think that the Donald Trump tariffs are unpo very unpopular among U.S. allies. And, and they're not very popular even among Trump supporters uh, in the agriculture community. So I think you're, you would see a shift there. But I, I also uh, think that uh, for on the Chinese side, it might be a little bit dangerous because uh, Joe Biden would try to repair relations with U.S. allies, and you might see some sort of an economic containment strategy that would involve Australia and Japan uh, and Korea and India. So, so I think that for, Ch for China, the Joe Biden presidency would be several steps forward, but it would also uh, leave some room for, uh, for some anxiety. You know, trade um, relations is, is a key focus here. Um, President Trump said he's okay with the total yeah. economic decoupling with China. He tweeted about it a few days ago, but U.S. Uh, trade uh, Representative right. Robert Lighthizer said Chinese officials are ready to honor their commitment uh, for the phase one trade deal. Uh, what would be the fate of this trade deal, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I consider that complete 
cognitive dissonance. Uh, the China and the U.S. Trade Office say we will honor the trade deal that we have agreed to. Uh, Donald Trump just tweets random thoughts, and I think that he was just responding uh, to people saying uh, that we cannot decouple. Donald Trump doesn't want to be told what to do. I think the, the, the issue of decoupling would be very serious, and I think it's a lot more complicated than Donald Trump thinks. The international supply chain is very complicated. You could revise it so that China is not as important in American corporate supply chains, but I think it would be almost impossible within a decade to completely decouple. I don't think it's realistic. I think that's a political slogan more than anything else in 2020. Yeah, uh, talk about uh, anti-China alliance that is forming, uh, you know, in the eyes of many experts. Uh, Trump said he, he wants to invite additional countries to join the G7, namely uh, Australia, Russia, South Korea, and India. Uh, it's been suggested that he has the intention of forming a wider um, alliance against China to hedge right. against Beijing. Uh, how do you look at that? Well, I mean, that's an excellent question and, and an important point. I think that... Uh, the trade hawks in America would like to have a new alliance. I think the G7 is not going to go away, but there are some people in the State Department, some people in the foreign policy establishment who talk about a D10, democracies, uh, industrial democracies, to expand the G7 to create a new parallel institution that would include Australia, that would include South Korea, that would include India. And yes, if, I mean, you could see that it obviously would be met as a counterbalance to China. But, but Donald Trump can't unilaterally change the G7. What he can do people to his party. He is the host. It rotates every year. And he could invite anyone he wants uh, to attend. But I don't think it will be an anti-China party if Russia is involved. I mean, Vladimir Putin is not going to be part of any uh, political campaign event masquerading as a G7 uh, to bash China. Now, if Russia decides not to attend, I think that you will have a G7 that ends up being a uh, half political rally with Trump uh, using India, using Australia, using Korea to bash China. But I don't think the Europeans, is, with the bulwark of the, G, of the G7, uh, with Japan uh, being an Asian representative would have much to do with that. So I think you're going to see a lot of political theater, but I don't think you're going to see any agreement coming out of the G7. I think you'll see a campaign rally with, with these world leaders as props, but I don't think you will see any substantive policies coming out of the G7 uh, that would be of concern to China. Well, Rick, can you explain to our viewers uh, in China and around the world the policy-making dynamics of the U.S. Congress uh, that has been a traditional yeah. power center in the United States uh, that is getting increasingly anti-China, if you will. Uh, think about uh, Marco Rubio, who is now serving as the de facto chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, a key component of America's right. um, military-industrial complex, um, uh, you know, in place of the, the absence of the former chair. Um, Talk to us about the dynamics of U.S. Congress in foreign policy making. Well, I, I started covering Congress in 1984 uh, in a different world, but I think that what people have to realize is the Congress is independent of the executive branch. It's supposed to be a co-equal uh, branch, and, and uh, the, the election I, that right now, over the past decade. Congress seems to be so focused on the next election that you see, you see more political posturing posing as legislation than you did in the past. Now, I think the chairman of committees are very important. And Marco Rubio is the most anti-communist chair of a major committee uh, probably in several decades since Jesse Helms. I mean, he, he's of Cuban extraction. He's very critical of the Castro regime and, it, and its successors in Cuba. And he has been perhaps the loudest and most consistent voice against the Chinese Communist Party in Washington. So the fact that he moved up to be the de facto chair, the acting chair of the Intelligence Committee, means that you probably will have both hearings into uh, allegations of Chinese abuses 
and you will have legislation coming out. I, I, I do think we should expect more. If you look at the Democrats, Nancy Pelosi has been a critic of China over the years. Uh, everything from women's rights to Tibet to Xinjiang and now Hong Kong. And so I think that you have a confluence of events where you have Democrats who are pro-human rights, who are critics of China on human rights, and you have Republicans who are sort of Cold War anti-communists, and they both see an election coming in November, and I think that they will concentrate on their criticisms, uh, mostly for political reasons, but some for policy reasons, because they firmly do believe in what they're saying. Uh, it's just that um, I, I have not seen a period of time on Capitol Hill where you have a bipartisan consensus uh, like this on China and on Russia, I would say, as well. Rick, I, I'm, it, I'm it, sorry it to interrupt, but I think our other way. guest, um, Samira, yeah. just uh, joined us. Samira, um, yeah. good yeah. to have you with us. The Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act of 2020 calls on U.S. President to impose sanctions under uh, Global Magnitsky Act on Chinese officials, among other things. How do you look at this U.S. bail on Xinjiang? Well, it's painfully obvious that this is part of the all-out uh, offensive against China, um, which is economic, diplomatic, and obviously geopolitical. Now, um, Xinjiang province is crucial for Belt and Road. And it's also not a coincidence right now that there is fighting going on between China and India, America's closest ally in the fight against China in Aksai Chin, which is also part of Xinjiang province. And it's, like I said, crucial for Belt and Road. Now, what's interesting is that um, there isn't much merit to these uh, uh, human rights violations, uh, these allegations of human rights violations, because one, it's only Western countries and Japan that accuse China of Islamophobia, and Muslim majority countries actually support China's policy there. Um, the Organization for Islamic Cooperation also praises China's treatment of uh, Muslims, particularly in Xinjiang province. And um, it's really obvious that this is just part of the U.S. war against China. Um, along with Xinjiang, they're um, also fanning uh, separatist tensions in uh, Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in Tibet of course, but uh, right now, because there are um, economic incentives to uh, fan ethnic separatist movements in uh, Xinjiang, they're focusing on this one first. And they're also trying to spark Sinophobia in the Muslim world. Uh, we have about uh, 30 seconds left. Uh, do you think an anti-China alliance is forming in Washington? Oh, absolutely. Um, there is uh, this blue dot network that the U.S. has started, um, which also includes countries like India and Japan. Um, interesting fact about India, India is one of the few countries that refuses to join One Belt, One Road. And um, another interesting aspect to all of this is that, um, you, you know, we have a people like um, Pompeo who are trying to get, convince corporations to move from China and set up base in India. And India welcomes this. All right, Samira, that will do it for this edition of Dialogue. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing.